Good evening, and welcome to Unlock the Door Radio. This is your host, Michael Cross, here, and hopefully we will have an hour of very stimulating information and sharing. Because tonight's guest, and I'm very happy uh, that she's agreed to share information with us, is Leah Grenfield. And she is a lecturer, she is an author, and, uh, well, I'll just say she's done three uh, books that have had extremely good reviews. Uh, one was Nationalism, Five Roads to Modernity, The Spirit of Capitalism, Nationalism, and Economic Growth, and her latest is Mine, Modernity, and Madness, The Impact of Culture on Human Experience. A little bit more about her. She's a professor at Boston University, and she teaches everything from sociology, political science, anthropology, and psychology. So I think we're going to be in for some really interesting perspectives in the field of culture and psychology. So welcome to the show. Hello. Yes, welcome. Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Okay. Well, if you'd like, you can um, elaborate and tell us a little bit more about yourself and what got you interested in in uh, being such a prolific writer and researcher. Well, I'll tell you uh, about this project, uh, Mind, Modernity, Madness, in particular. Um, I have been teaching uh, in a very large university of uh, for quite some time and um, it became uh, very clear to me uh, from uh, the start more or less that many of my students uh, very bright uh, young American adults were extremely unhappy Many of them were, in effect, clinically depressed. I tried once to explain to a class of about 40 uh, very bright undergraduates the situation in medieval Europe where people lived uh, more or less in constant physical pain. This should come as no surprise to anyone if we remember that uh, people had always suffered from such uh, ailments as toothache and headache and common colds and uh, worse things, and there were no over the counter painkillers. And uh, there was no anesthesia for surgical operations. So you can imagine that people indeed suffered a lot from physical pain. Imagine us without any access to aspirin. So as I was uh, telling this to my students, they uh, looked very surprised and unconvinced. And instead of sympathy towards their ancestors, what I saw in their reaction was indifference. They would say to me, well, they probably got used to it because if it was so constant, they must have get, uh, get used to it. Or if it were really bad, they probably would do something about it. And if they didn't, it means that it wasn't that bad. So I was looking for a possibility to make uh, them convinced that there can exist a form of suffering which is really unbearable and which nevertheless must be born because there is nothing to do about it. So I asked them, who among you has suffered or known somebody close to you of your generation to have suffered from clinical depression? And when I asked this question, I saw that the light in their bright eyes went out. 
and every one of them raised their hand. So I already felt that depression was extremely um, widespread in American society among young people. But this was uh, the last piece of proof that I needed to become really preoccupied with that. Now, my uh, studies uh, on nationalism before that uh, led me to a hypothesis uh, that uh, that uh, this kind of disease, uh, depression, clinical depression, as well as uh, manic depression and schizophrenia, uh, must have been related uh, in time to the phenomenon of nationalism. And nationalism was the very beginning of modern society. In fact, nationalism represents the very framework, the cultural framework of modern society. Why is it the framework of modern society? Nationalism is a very specific perspective on reality. Uh, it imagines reality, it focuses on the social reality because in general reality is imagined secular, so there is no God. And uh, society, which is the focus of this imagination, is seen as a sovereign community of equals. That is a society with fundamentally equal membership which governs itself. Okay, so you can see. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I was going to say it sounds like then that uh, the modern uh, nationalism or nationhood idea uh, probably what from from Great Britain that idea yes. of kind of an from equality yes. yes from Great Britain Be yes because nationalism yes okay I was gonna say because before that it seems that um, most societies even the even the advanced societies of Greece and Rome were highly uh, stratified so you kind of knew your place and when you grew up you you were told this is who you are whereas precisely. okay go ahead go ahead yes precisely you're absolutely right so uh nationalism emerged this vision this new perspective on reality emerged in fact as you said in uh, england in the 16th century uh there were very specific historical reasons we do not have to go into them why it happened then but uh, this signified the um, uh, new era in the history of humanity, uh, beginning with England. Uh, this idea of the nation that is a sovereign community of equals, uh, which is fundamentally secular, spread to other societies uh, several centuries later, uh, France was the first continental society to follow. It followed the 18th century. Then most of our societies developed the sense of nationhood in the 19th uh, and 20th centuries. Most European societies in the 19th century and then uh, on other continents, 20th, uh, uh, 20th century. Mm -hmm. Now, um, as you said before, the other societies the societies before nationalism, uh, which were um, religious societies and highly stratified, and their stratification was very much uh, connected to uh, their religious worldview. People who were born in those societies uh, were told by their environment where they belong and who they are. They had a very clear identity 
which they received from their social environment. Now, a society which is neither religious nor um, stratified, but rather is egalitarian in principle, does not teach the individual who or what she, he or she is. So such a society, which is our modern society, uh, places the burden for the formation of one's identity on the shoulders of the individual. The formation of an identity is an essential element, the core element of the healthy functioning of the mind. So the, the when one does not uh, uh, say it again. I was going to say so. So, in kind of psychological terms, the you, you're yeah, talking about you you're talking about then the self identity or the ego, as it's often referred to, the the perception of who you are uh, in relationship to your environment. Exactly. Uh, sometimes it is referred to as the ego, but in fact, it is self identity. It is the um, uh, one's definition of oneself as a member of a certain uh, cultural environment. It is. Uh, it can be likened to um, to a cognitive map of one's uh, significant in environment and one's place in that environment. Right. It is not only your relationship to all your significant others and uh, the expectations those significant others may have from you. It is the definition of uh, what rights and duties you have, what kinds of uh, behaviors are appropriate and what kinds of uh, conduct is inappropriate for you. It is the definition of who your friends should be, whom you should marry, whom you should never consider marrying, whom you should like and whom you should dislike, right? Uh, but it is also your relationship to various um, uh, non-human significant uh, elements in your environment. For instance, it is your relationship to God. It is your relationship to the national flag. It is your relationship to a particular football team uh, or a particular type of literature a particular type of music, etc., etc. You get the picture. This, this is what an identity is. Now, it is fundamentally a cultural map. Uh, however, uh, uh, it, it is um, uh, it, uh, it it is easy to imagine it as a map. And uh, if you imagine it as a map, you can also imagine where uh, in the brain uh, this sort of uh, cultural symbolic uh, construct would be supported by which part of the brain it is something similar to what we have discovered in uh, uh, mice for example as their place cells right mm -hmm. uh, when you have uh, uh, the place the space is the changing part of uh, a mouse's environment. So um, there is always a map in those place cells in the mouse's brain of what opportunities for escape, for um, uh, food, uh, etc. the mouse has at any given moment. So our uh, identity, our cognitive cultural map should be something like that. And at all points, it shows us, right, mm -hmm. from inside, what rights and duties we have. Okay, yeah, now, now yeah. establishing that, then you say that... Say it again? Well, establishing that, you're saying that about 500 years ago or so, in starting in uh, Britain, and then expanding outwards, the idea of egalitarianism 
sort of gave this uh, picture, and maybe it was flawed in the sense that obviously not everyone is equal. Some people have more opportunities than others and so forth. But in an, I don't hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? There. If, if yes. people believe that everyone is equal and on the same playing field as is the um, – at least the ideal in an yes. egalitarian society. But then, yes. obviously, not everyone is equal uh, in all respects. Some are born with more uh, wealth, some with more intelligence, some with more beauty, all these kinds of things. Then is it fair to say that this causes stress to the self-identity and maybe we started seeing – a lot of what we uh, well would call today mental illness, we started seeing um, increases in that 500 years ago. I don't hear you. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I'm talking right in the mic there. What happened to the state of mental illness about 500 years ago? Well, that, 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 let, let me continue. Okay. So, uh, yes. So, a remarkable thing, you see, a remarkable thing, I, I hypothesize that since the situation changed in this way, before that, one would get one's identity from the environment. If you were born uh, as a daughter of a shoemaker, you knew precisely what your duties and responsibilities were and what your future was. You knew that you would become the wife of another shoemaker and you will become a mother of more shoemakers, right? Mm -hmm. Everything was everything was absolutely determined. You knew it uh, with every detail. You knew what kind of uh, of what kind of fashions you're going to wear. You knew what kind of fabrics you could use to make your dresses. You knew what kind of foods you were supposed to uh, eat and cook. Now nothing is clear. Everything. If you are taking a nation of uh, 320 million people like that of the United States, then any one of those 320 million people is equal to everyone else and therefore can live the life in, in principle of anyone else, right? Mm -hmm. So this is not very definite. What it means is that uh, it becomes very difficult to actually construct one's identity. Egalitarianism, equality in itself, is a very difficult thing that makes uh, psychological well-being very difficult to achieve. Just the value of equality in itself. Now, so I have hypothesized that um, given that the situation changed in this dramatic way, uh, probably certain mental diseases, certain mental diseases appeared just at the time when society became modern and was redefined in this way. And so in my historical research, I discovered that indeed, while mental illness, of course, is as ancient as humanity, and there were numerous mental illnesses all the time, certain mental illnesses, and in particular those we later called schizophrenia, manic depressive disorder, and depression, major unipolar depression, all appeared at the same time as nationalism. And it, they appeared appeared in England first in England in the 16th century. As I follow, at, at first, all those diseases were regarded as the same disease. And uh, they, a new word appeared in English, a new word that is the creation of the 16th century. And this word was madness. Those diseases were called madness. 
Now, before that, there existed a very well-developed medical vocabulary for mental illnesses. However, that existing vocabulary clearly could not capture the nature of those new diseases. And so a new word had to be invented to describe them. What was so specific about those mental, new mental disease that was called madness? It was all considered the same disease. What was specific about it was that they were diseases of the will. That is, one could not control either one's thoughts or one's actions or both one's thoughts and one's actions. Do you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Cl loud and clear. Uh, yes. Yes. So one could see that sometimes this disease expressed itself in that uh, one could not um, uh, motivate oneself to act at all, was completely unmotivated, right? Uh, uh, and one could not motivate, uh, could not motivate one's Thought, could not move one's thought from, from certain subjects. And this uh, we see, for example, in, in uh, unipolar depression. One constantly has morbid thoughts and nothing distracts, can distract one's attention from those very morbid thoughts. And one also cannot uh, get motivated to act. One becomes completely paralyzed. So the characteristics of depression and uh, in the characteristics of mania, we see that one simply cannot control one's thoughts at all. They they constantly run away from oneself and similar is instead of uh, being uh, constantly attached to a certain subject, they just run all over the place and uh, one no longer feels that those are one's own thoughts because they're so completely out of control. The same happens with one's actions. One can do things, terrible things sometimes, and then being unable to explain it and saying, well, it was not me. I was not in control with myself. It was not me. And sometimes uh, in, in the most uh, um, extraordinary cases, it is both, both the thought and the act and, and both negative and positive lack of control. Uh, and not only uh, the, the content of thought, but even the very structure of thought becomes out of control. And in this case, we call it schizophrenia. Uh, and an individual becomes completely ununderstandable, either to oneself or to the observers. That's why we call schizophrenia, we describe schizophrenia as so bizarre because one simply cannot follow the logic of one's actions and the language and thought. Okay, just a real quick here. I think a lot of people think that there's probably some sort of diagnosis for schizophrenia that would show that there's some defect in the brain. Um, but yet, is there? I mean, if you if you look at someone who has schizophrenia and someone who does not have schizophrenia, is there any brain structure difference? No, there is no. No such thing has been discovered. And as I said, psychiatry, in fact, emerged together with this new type of mental disease that was called madness. It emerged first in England in the 16th century. The, this is where we have our first psychiatric tr uh, text, and it emerged to treat precisely those uh, those diseases, to treat and understand. But so far, we have not arrived at an etiological understanding of schizophrenia or of the depressive diseases. And this means that there is no precise biological diagnosis, you see. Sometimes in statistical samples, you can see that certain features 
uh, can be discovered more in the brains of people affected with schizophrenia as against a control group that is not affected with schizophrenia. But those statistical studies, one should always keep in mind, are done on people who have already been diagnosed and treated for schizophrenia, which means that they have been drugged, which means that we cannot say precisely whether the differences in the samples, you know, mm -hmm. are the result of the disease or of the treatment of the disease. Okay, so, so your hypothesis then is that this psychological ailment is ultimately uh, actually connected more to a sociological ailment, that being the structure of the society. Exactly. Uh, it is fundamentally caused, those psychiatric diseases fundamentally are caused by the modern culture, which does not allow us to form or makes it very difficult for us to form an identity. And one can really connect uh, the problems with the will to problems with identity. A person who has a very clear identity, who knows precisely what he or she is, will always be in control of oneself. Yeah, I, I, I recall when I've read about Durkheim that he found that yeah. when Emil Durkheim did studies on such things as suicide, he found that people that came from very strong Catholic or Jewish backgrounds, uh, families, tended to have a very low rate as opposed to Protestants. And, of course, he theorized that it was because of the social structure. But you would also maybe maintain that it has to do with when you grow up in a strong family, then that gives you a certain sense of identity with the family as opposed to the culture. Well, uh, you see, the family is also a part of culture. Mm -hmm. what, what I mean is that when you view the world, when you view the world in a certain way, when you have a certain type of consciousness, right? Yeah. Such as national consciousness, it permeates all of your life. It permeates your, your uh, family life. You, uh, when... Uh, um, now we're talking about families uh, in, uh, in modern culture. Uh, those mothers and fathers, they see uh, that society in general is egalitarian, that they're all equal. So to begin with, the roles, social roles of mothers and fathers may be confused. Nobody knows who should be the primary caregiver. Uh, for example, right? Uh, recently in the United States, there is quite a lot of talk about how miserable men have become uh, in uh, this very egalitarian society. Men no longer know what their role is and how to be a good husband, whether one has to be a good husband and good father, whether one has to be a good provider, or whether one has to be, uh, you know, a good uh, soulmate or something like that. Uh, one is no longer given any guidance, right? Mm -hmm. so one becomes confused, one becomes confused and insecure. Uh, and you see, and there is a lot of this appointment too, constantly, uh, from uh, one's partner. So uh, there is a lot of confusion. As a result, some people may be quite paralyzed in their actions and become very depressed, right? And then think about children growing up with such parents. Those children, to begin with, cannot really uh, form uh, a very clear identity. What happens in modern society, in modern culture, in the family or not in the family, 
uh, in the family and outside the family is that the individual, the child, is given from the very beginning too many choices for self-definition. And it becomes very difficult for this child who is not guided in any way and cannot be guided given the unguiding open nature of our culture. This child cannot be guided. And so this child has to make a choice among many, many, many choices. Now it is possible, for example, for the child to choose his or her sex. Mm -hmm. One before, for example, if one was born a girl or was born a boy, that was it, right? Yeah, <laughs> biologically, sure. That was it biologically. Now it is no longer so. It is possible to have an operation. Now, how can a child decide whether he or she wants to be a boy or a girl? Yeah, the absolutely no such possibility so in, but one does decide right yes so one one is constantly unsure uncertain of what and who one is and this uncertainty this uh lack of cognitive map of identity leads to problems, severe problems with the will. And and can result and does result in 20% of cases in one in five individuals does result in severe mental disability. I think you said uh, in somewhere I, I was I came across that the one in five adult figure that is true right. in America one actually is madness according to the old definitions. That is true. And before everyone thinks it's America, you said too that countries like Sweden are also very high in this. Uh, I don't hear you again. Oh, that countries like uh, in Scandinavia uh, okay. also have a, a high level of this. Right. But but also, you know, Britain, France, Western society. You see, the closer the closer society approximates the ideal of an egalitarian society. And the more choices it offers its members for self-definition, the more widespread mental disease of this type is in this society. In the research that I did, I uh, could uh, establish that these diseases, schizophrenia, manic depression, and depression, these diseases of the will, started spreading in different societies precisely together with the penetration of the idea of the nation into these societies and into different classes within these societies. So to begin with, it is the upper classes that are most strongly affected because it is the upper classes that have the most choices for self-definition. As Durkheim said, and in fact, in, in this book, I uh, use Durkheim quite a lot. You are right to point to uh, the importance of his work. As Durkheim said, I, in regard to suicide, I noticed in my case, in regard to mental health, that poverty in particular serves as an important protective factor. 
people who are poor are much less likely to be mad, to be affected by any one of these diseases than people who are affluent. And one can also see this in regard to all societies. It is the most affluent and the most prosperous Western societies which are the most affected by schizophrenia, manic depressive disorder and depression. And it is the poorest and least developed societies that are the least affected by them. I'm wondering, I'm wondering, you know, we, you're saying the approx, you know, it seems like the f closer you were to Britain, which of course gave a certain level of uh, the culture spread, you know, through its colonies, but also in geographical proximity. But today we have a global media, a, a corporate global media uh, structure that do you think that this is starting to create a certain ideal that is going to affect everyone worldwide at some point, uh, regardless of their socioeconomic background? Well, uh, one would think so. But given our data, remarkably, this is not so. Um, uh, World Health Organization, um, the psychiatric team that studied the, uh, made a longitudinal study for some 30 years of schizophrenia around the world, and also repeatedly made the general studies of, uh, conducted studies of mental disease in general, constantly, constantly records something that they consider a persistent anomaly because it runs counter to their hypothesis. And those persistent anomalies are two. First is that all the Asian societies, even very developed, such as Japan or the China, right, mm -hmm. still have a tremendously lower rates these mental diseases than the Western societies. And uh, this causes constant bafflement to those researchers. And the other anomaly is that undeveloped societies, poor societies, are much less, tremendously much less affected by these diseases than affluent Western societies. I have a very, and it, it is really, uh, you see, both uh, um, uh, this uh, affluence and security of life, general security of life, um, pose no limits, allow to the individual, you see, to um, impose no limits on one's choices. If one can afford anything, there is a lot of things to afford, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of choice. If one can afford only very little, you do not have that much choice. Similar uh, in regard to security. If, if your security demands that you behave in a certain way, uh, you will have fewer choices than if you feel completely secure and then can do whatever you want. So I have actually a remarkable uh, uh, comparison, and it is that uh, in Israel, uh, which is much less secure society and of course much less prosperous than the United States and the Western European societies, has a much, much lower rate of those diseases than um, uh, than the prosperous and secure Western societies. I, and this is, is despite the fact that it belongs to the Western societies, that it is very well developed and all that. But uh, the lack of security 
and the uh, lower level of prosperity impose such limits on the amount of choices that you don't find such a uh, uh, high rate of those diseases. So um, I would assume then too that if there's been any studies that probably Eastern European countries would also ha have a lower rate of these problems. Yes, and they had much lower rates before the fall of communism. Now they have higher rates, but uh, it is much higher rates. But it is also possible that this is transitory, you see, that uh, this co is caused by the historical moment of anomie in those societies, of complete disorganization and disorientation in those societies. Certainly, they had much lower levels uh, before the fall of communism. Mm -hmm. And it should be pointed out, too, that there may be, I mean, to, to validate this, there, there may be some that would say, well, maybe they didn't have the medical knowledge, but yet during the communist era, they had a large professional oh, class. Russia, yes, Russia has been on the fourth front of psychiatric research actually from uh, the very beginning of the well, actually from the end of the 19th century um, precisely uh, at the time when uh, the diagnosis as we know them you know the diagnosis of schizophrenia of affective disorders and so on uh, were uh, established uh, Russia was uh, one of the main psychiatric superpowers uh, so that uh, certainly it was not a problem, but of course it had a very, very small um, um, upper class, uh, and uh, those ideas, those diseases are concentrated in the upper classes, in distinction to other mental diseases which are universally spread, uh, organic mental diseases. Those cultural mental diseases really affect only those classes that are exposed to many choices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've also noted, I don't know if this is related to it, but um, it's often been said that you don't have anorexia unless you have affluence in a society. Exactly. And actually, anorexia. Uh, just as schizophrenia was de divided from, separated from affective disorders, while in the beginning diagnosis of medical insanity, they were all lumped together as one disease. So anorexia or uh, eating disorders was separated from depression. But in general, anorexia is a part of depression. You very rarely, in fact, I would say you never meet anorexia without depression. Mm -hmm. And so, obviously, you know, it's usually you statistically you don't find that much anorexia amongst uh, poor poor people. I, I remember I saw an, I, I saw an um, a study that was done on depression and Mexican immigrants, and actually it was quite interesting because it went. A lot, I think they even quoted Durkheim. Because the first generation immigrants, usually when they have lots of brothers and sisters and lots of cousins and so forth, there seems to be a very low level of depression diagnosed amongst yeah. those people. Right. But right. within three generations, after you know yes. they're, they've entered the middle class, then yes. it, it starts in. It, it, it starts yes. to… You, you are absolutely right. In fact, uh, second and third generation immigrants are among the groups uh, most uh, afflicted by those diseases. And, and this is remarkable because very often in their, in their native environment, you know, uh, where the family is from, there may be extremely low rates of those diseases. But when they immigrate to the West, for example, Mexicans, when they immigrate to the United States, it is one of the groups most affected. The rates become, the rates skyrocket. 
the same can be said about Caribbeans, Caribbean uh, immigrants in uh, Great Britain. They are among the groups most affected by those diseases, while <clears throat> in the Caribbeans you find extremely low rates. So it can be explained biologically, you see. Okay. It can also be explained by the effect of modern egalitarian culture. So just a curious, just curious, though, what do you feel that the effects of, for instance, the commercial media have been on this? I mean, it, it, is it, does it exasperate the problem most amongst the upper classes by just giving more and more and more real and imagined yes. choices to them? Yes, of course. You have, of course, it also affects the other classes, but the other classes may have the limits, you know, the limits of their uh, situation that doesn't allow them those choices, in fact. However, in the United States, where the, uh, where the class structure is so fluid, everyone constantly has a choice. Yeah. The United, United States, you know, one doesn't, I mean, we only talk about classes as a current socioeconomic position, but somebody can have, be, you know, a CEO in some company uh, one day and the next day one will lose this job and become unemployed. And then one belongs to a completely different class, right? Mm -hmm. So basically what we have to consider uh, are the choices that the children are presented with. Okay, so so how, does this relate at all to I, – I was reading that because of the economy being what it is in the United States, uh, it's usually much worse than the way the media presents it, um, that – the rate of depression and suicide has really gone up amongst, uh, well, said white, forty and fifty somethings, and like you were saying, that some, you you may have started out with an infinity of choices, and then you lose your job and you can't get another job, or you are um, you're having to take a job that's far less than where you were. But wouldn't your mind still be set on this is who I am because you were raised to believe that everything is what you determine? And so therefore, yes. if, if you're 55 years old and you were a uh, manager at a um, some sort of high-tech firm or something and you lose your job, right. in America it's almost seen as, well, you're a failure, and so it's your fault. Uh, uh that is uh, absolutely right. On the other hand, you know, uh, since 2008, uh, there has not been statistical studies of, uh, uh, of mental disease of this scope. Uh, and uh, when you think about uh, uh, the jumps in suicide, I think the last study was done in 2010. And the suicide, rates of suicide and rates of mental disease have been higher for absolutely every single uh, next cohort after uh, those born in, in 1940. Mm -hmm. So there has been a constant rise in uh, both mental illness and in suicide among those, those particular people that you're talking about in every single cohort. Now, when you think about uh, the advertised uh, suicides, uh, they happen uh, during every Wall Street crash. Yeah. So in, so in 1929, there was a spate of highly advertised suicides too, because obviously this is a, you know, this is a terrible shock to the system. But when you think about aggregates, you know, uh, and aggregate statistics, then uh, I don't think that the current crisis had, uh, you know, had any, uh, any, um, um, uh, 
the important role to play in what is happening already. There is a secular trend. It is a very long trend of the constant rise in, uh, in those diseases uh, in uh, this type of society. Okay, as we go more globalized, you know, you're, you're saying then that if the, the Asian cultures, even as they've advanced, have not had the same rise as one might have expected. Uh, do you foresee that could change in the future if maybe... I don't hear you. Okay, sorry about that. I don't... don't. If, if... Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. If, as time goes on, Asian countries start to... Uh, their their view of the family and that kind of hierarchical structure that exists in their society today. As we see more globalization, might we expect an evolution into more of looking like our culture as time goes on? Well, uh, we have an example. One society that has been uh, highly industrialized and uh, a major uh, major economic power, um, the second largest economy for a very, very long time until it was replaced recently, and this is Japan. And nothing of the sort happened there. It uh, functions very well as a modern society, uh, as a society in economic respect, uh, in the scientific respect, very similar to um, European and American societies, but its fundamental culture, its values have not changed. And uh, indeed, um, uh, I don't see any reason to, uh, and, and the rates of those diseases remain very low in Japan in comparison to Western societies. Even though suicide is very high, but for very different reasons. Suicide is a particular cultural pattern in Japan. It, is, it cannot be explained as a psychological phenomenon. It is a cultural phenomenon. Uh, it is an appropriate action in certain situations. So, um, I, I don't uh, see any reason to foresee uh, such uh, convergence between the psychological patterns of the Western societies and, and other great Asian cultures. Um, okay, so that brings me to this. We got, we, we've got, obviously, if you're saying one in five adults in the United States, and the same seems to be true of Scandinavia and some of the other Northwestern European nations. Um, maybe, maybe slightly less because uh, the United States really leading is really leading the world. It is number one. Okay. So, yeah. Now, I also read that the the use of psychoactive drugs, prescription drugs for mental disorders, there's more that are prescribed in the United States than the rest of the world combined, even though America is only um, four a little over 4% of the world population. Um, do you, what would you suggest uh, if you could in some way affect the American culture? Again, I don't hear you. Again, I don't hear you. I'm okay. sorry. If you could affect American culture, what yes. cha which, which changes would you make to be able to still have uh, the affluence that seems to exist, at least for a lot of people, and be able to reduce these mental disturbances? I think that uh, given the explanation of, uh, of the causes, the etiological explanation of those diseases that I have arrived at, uh, which is cultural, right, cultural explanation, the only cure or the only method of prevention while keeping our values and therefore keeping our prosperity and uh, our open society uh, is uh, seems to be education. 
we have to um, revamp our system of education and teach our children and our young people from the very from very early age uh, about the nature of modern society and how it operates and what kinds of requirements there are in a modern society towards the individual in particular that the individual is responsible for the definition of one's own identity. Uh, I actually found, because um, uh, I was, as I was writing this book and uh, doing this research, I also taught classes on this subject all the time. And as I told you, so many of my students from the very beginning were depressed. Uh, and uh, as I began working on this subject, many more were coming specifically because they learned by word of mouth that my classes were kind of therapy classes. And um, a number of people, well, all of them benefited from that. And a number of people were in fact cured from severe depression and from anorexia among other things, because through this, through the understanding of how modern society works and what psychological burdens it puts on the individual, this very understanding placed them immediately in control of the situation. And it was this feeling when they felt that now I am in control that allowed them somehow to really restructure their minds. And through this restructuring, you see, they were able to um, to cure themselves. Uh, because those diseases, as the mental process in general, this is a process. It is not something, some sort of cancer that is a body that grows in your organs, right? Mental diseases are a process. <clears throat> and so by changing the process, <coughs> you can actually change the course of disease. So as an educator or a parent, if you take the time to teach the children basically Here's how the society operates. Here's the stresses that will come at you. Then yes. they're better able to have a defense mechanism against Precisely. these. Precisely. Precisely. You prepare them for that and you place them in control of the situation. Okay, it sounds excellent. Now, you know, we have two minutes left. And in those two minutes, uh, mm. tell – I want you to tell our audience what – I mean, you know, about your, your your latest book and why they should read that. Because if you've got this kind of information there about how to help uh, yourself, the youth, as well as, you know, if you're a parent, your children, what is contained in your book that's going to help those kids have a, have a better image of themselves but also not fall prey to these uh, psychological disorders? Well, um, um, you know, I can uh, tell you this in the words of my students <clears throat> when they write their course evaluations. They usually write, those courses teach you how to be happy. Those courses teach you how to find your footing in the confusing modern world. So <clears throat> I believe that uh, any reader uh, would uh, find one's footing through this book in the confusing modern world. But uh, in addition to that, it is just plain very interesting. The materials contained there are fascinating. Mm -hmm. Well, excellent. Okay, well, we're just about out of time. So uh, the book, the most recent of your books, I'll just say it again, is Mind, Modernity, and Madness, The Impact of Culture on Human Experience. And you can just check that, and I 
that you'll find it available at different sources. And again, thank you so very much, Professor Greenfield, for Greenfield, for sharing this really vital information. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Okay, take care. Uh, bye now, okay. and hope everyone tunes in next week for another interesting episode of Unlock the Door.